Let us pray. O Lord, to whom else shall we go? You alone have the words of eternal life. Amen. Dearly beloved, bought by the blood of Jesus Christ and finding all of your fullness in him, grace and peace to you. Have you ever tried to pull up a tree, just a, a really little one? It doesn't seem like it would be that hard, but it is. Or the bushes that we had here in the front of the parking lot the other year, we went to pull those out on work day. Craig had to bring his V8 and his chains, and <laughs> I kind of barely got the job done. What about a tree, like a big tree? Mature and fully grown. I don't think the V8 would be up to the task. It's because of the roots, of course. They, they go broad and long and deep, clinging with tremendous tenacity to every inch of ground. You are trees, the Bible says, planted by the seed of the word of God and growing by that word into Christ. Roots sent down deeper into him. That he is everything to you. Growing into him in every way. You draw your life from him, your hope, your joy, your strength. He is your fullness. That's why Paul says in, in this text, as you received Christ Jesus the Lord, so walk in him. He's saying the way that you were brought to faith in Jesus through the word of God is the same way that you are to continue. There's nothing different. It's not like you start with Jesus and you know, that's the basics and then later you find out more important stuff. It's Jesus at the beginning and Jesus at the end and Jesus everywhere in between. He's everything. It's like this uh, shirt my brother used to have. It said, baseball is life. The rest is just detail. Or I think I've seen another slogan before, something like, baseball isn't just everything, it's the only thing. Of course, those phrases are both false. I'm talking about baseball. But they are true if you substitute Christ. Christ isn't just everything. He is the only thing. Christ is life. The rest is just detail. What Paul is doing here in this text is building a philosophy according to Christ. And we talked about some philosophies last week because Paul was combating this idea that was around in the Colossian congregation, one which is around in a lot of ideas and philosophies today as well. And you know, what philosophy is really trying to do is to provide an answer, an answer to a question. It's like a crime scene. And what does a detective do when he shows up on the crime scene? Well, he looks around at all the evidence, he interrogates, he investigates, and he tries to make everything fit. He needs to find an answer that fits all of the evidence. And if it only fits some of the evidence and not all of it, he better go back and look again. Philosophy tries to do the same thing. Only the crime scene is all of human existence and all of the world. They're trying to find an answer that fits everything about what we have known and experienced what the answer to life is. Where did it come from and why are we here and where are we going and why is there suffering and what happens after we die? But they can't. Human philosophy cannot find an answer. It's been spinning its wheels for 6,000 years. Every time it tries, it fails. Now, once in a while, it hits on something that's true, you know, particularly the old Greek philosophers and the ways that they focused on what is true, noble, beautiful, and good. That's the best thing that human philosophy can figure out, but it, it's still missing Christ. It's figured out the law, what is true and good and lovely in terms of how we should act, but it's missing Jesus in whom dwells the fullness of the Godhead bodily. That's why all these human philosophies, Paul says, are empty deceit, vain, lies. Because they are according to human tradition, he says, and because they are according to the elemental principles of the world. By human tradition, of course, he means that it's human thinking. It's just passed on from one generation to another, and we can't ever figure it out. Human reason isn't enough to comprehend God and the meaning of all things. 
The other phrase he uses there, it says in your translation, the elemental spirits of the world. That's a bad translation. It's just one word in Greek, and it's the plural of the word, the elemental things, you could say. And elemental is actually a pretty good translation. Like, we get our word elementary from that. And that's sort of the idea, you know, the elementary things, the basic things, the building block things. That's the idea of the word. And Paul tells us exactly what he means by this phrase later in the same chapter, Colossians 2, 20 to 23. If with Christ you died to the elemental spirits, elemental things of the world, why, as if you were still alive in the world, do you submit to regulations like do not handle, do not taste, do not touch? referring to things that all perish as they are used, according to human precepts and teachings. These have indeed an appearance of wisdom in promoting self-made religion and asceticism and severity to the body, but they are of no value in stopping the indulgence of the flesh. The ABCs, the elementary things of human thought in regard to God, are pretty obvious. Look around the world. Look at its religions. What do they all espouse? works. Do something to earn God's favor. Uh, Don't eat this. Don't drink that. In fact, it's kind of funny. Just the other day, I happened upon an article about how the Mormon church had emphasized again that, yes, it was wrong to drink green tea and and, and even coffee-flavored ice cream, right? They, They have these weird laws that they made up. Religions are always doing this, making up weird laws about what you can eat and what you can't eat. And the reason that they do this is because human beings sense by nature that there is a problem. There's there's trouble in the world and there's trouble in our hearts. And we realize that we're not perfect. But we don't realize the extent. You know, one of the phrases people like to use, instead of using a word like sin, is to say, well, we've all made mistakes. That's meant to minimize the seriousness. Or they'll say, well, no one's perfect. As if... That means it's not that big of a deal. The word that's used in our text is trespass. Verse 13, you were dead in your trespasses. And that gives us a really good idea of how serious the situation was. Now, the word trespass literally means a false step. Like you're supposed to walk a line and you don't. You go crooked. Or you're walking on a path in the woods and you take a wrong turn and you end up out in the middle of nowhere, out in the wilderness, and you don't know your way back. That's all of our situation by nature. Only we don't realize how bad it is. We we sort of think like, well, you know, I haven't gone that far away. Because here's the path that God's word and God's command lays out. He says, love your neighbor as yourself. And he tells us how. Commandments 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10. They teach you how to love your neighbor. And yet, every day, in a million little ways, in a thousand big ones, You don't, and I don't. Sometimes it's it's because we don't feel like it. Like, you know what you should do. You know that you should speak softly or kindly. You know that you should go and help so-and-so with that. But you just don't feel like it. You're just thinking about how tired you are and what a hard day you had. Or maybe you don't want to because you're remembering how they didn't help you last time, or you're feeling annoyed with them because of something. Sometimes it's even subtler than that. Sometimes you don't realize what kind of need somebody else has. And then later you might think, oh, you know, I I didn't realize, as if that gets you off the hook. You're not just called to love your neighbor when you realize that they need you. You're called to always realize their need. And the reason that you don't, that we don't always realize that our neighbor needs us is because we're too focused on ourselves. If we spend as much time paying attention to their situation, to their hardships, to their needs as we did to our own, we'd know in a second whenever they needed anything. God also says, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. And this one, half the time we probably don't even try. And yet probably think that we do. See, this is the hardest thing to do, and yet it's the easiest thing to fake, to pretend. Oh, yeah, God's cool. I love God. As if it was as easy as that. 
Now, in so many ways, we've gone astray from the path, but we probably think, well, you know, it was just a little false turn. I should be able to find my way back. And here's what humans do. This is what human philosophy, human tradition, the elemental things of the world, the law. This is the approach of getting back to God. I earn my way back by the things I do. So, so go back to that idea of, you know, the regulations, do not handle, do not taste, do not touch, etc. Let's say that uh, you had a problem with, with eating too much food. Like, not, you know, you really liked food and that's good, but sometimes you just ate more than you should. And it left you feeling bad, it left you without any energy to, to do the things you really should do during the day, and, it, and it, that it was causing you to be unhealthy and those sorts of things, okay? An ascetic approach, an ascetic means like, uh, like, like monastic, okay, like severity, like what he described, do not handle, do not taste, do not touch, would be to say, all right, only bread and water, food is bad. But notice what that does. It really blames God for my abuse. The food isn't bad. The cheeseburger isn't bad. The way that we abuse the good things that God has given us, that's bad. And the answer isn't to say, okay, I'm never going to have those things again, because what's really happening when we do that is we're saying, God, this thing that you gave me, it caused me to sin. And I've got to cut it out. Completely. That's the sort of thing that human philosophy dictates. A works approach to God which really ends up blaming him for our sins, which minimizes our trouble and our need for him. And it's empty to see. Paul mentions it, it has a uh, seeming wisdom in promoting a severity to the body, but it has no value in getting rid of the indulgence of the flesh. Say that you were trying to escape from temptation, and so you said, I'm going to move to the wilderness of Alaska. I won't be tempted there to get angry at my neighbor because I won't have any neighbors. I won't be tempted there to you know, sin sexually because there won't be any women around. You would find out that your sins had followed you as surely as your shadow. Because the sins don't come from outside. They come from in. They come from an evil heart that we all have. The philosophers... Human tradition, they can't figure this out. You know, it was Socrates, I think, who said, know thyself, but he didn't. No one can unless they know Christ. And this is why Paul says that you are to be rooted and built up in him with your roots deep down into him in every way, for him to be the answer to everything. He says, don't let anyone take you captive. We teach our children, right? to watch out, you know, stranger danger, like don't get in a car with somebody who offers you candy, all these sorts of things. We, we teach them how to not be taken captive. Paul's teaching you how to not be taken captive. They say if you don't stand for something, you'll fall for anything. And that's what he's saying. If you aren't rooted in Christ, you will fall to hell. Because all of these vain ideas, these empty philosophies will come and draw you aside, promising much and offering nothing, seeming wise and really nothing but a bag of wind. Anything that is not according to Christ is emptiness and foolishness. You know, a tree, it sinks its roots into the ground, not into the air. And it is only because they are in the ground that it holds firm, and so you with Christ. This is what Paul means in 2 Corinthians 10, 5, when he says, we destroy arguments and every lofty opinion raised against the knowledge of God and take every thought captive to obey Christ. Because the incarnation of Jesus is at the center of all of this. It is at the center of all things. When I say, when Paul says that you are rooted and grounded in Christ, he means that you are rooted and grounded in the man who is God. He is the fullness of the Godhead dwelling in bodily form. To believe what Paul is saying here is to throw out all human reason and philosophy because none of it can make any sense of the God-man Jesus. That baby who lay in Mary's arms, in him was all that God is. Nothing left out, nothing missing. And yet, 
God was not contained there either. And the father did not become a child. Neither did the spirit, but only the son. And yet these three weren't separated from each other. They are one in a perfect unity of fellowship, intermixing and mingling with each other. And yet each of them separate as well. Each of them filling all things. In this man, Jesus, is the eternal, perfect Godhead, which is above all and in all and through all. How can that be? Human wisdom, human philosophy laughs. Even many Christian teachings say that doesn't make any sense. But Luther had a good response. The proud and conceited spirit reveals his crude and doltish ideas. When he conceives of God's omnipresence, as though God were a huge, expansive being which fills the universe and even extends beyond it like a straw sack stuffed so full that the straw sticks out at the top and the bottom. In other words, as though God were omnipresent according to the local mode in a physical and tangible manner. If this were so, then indeed Christ's body would have to be a phantasm or a monster, an immense straw sack, large enough to comprehend God with heaven and earth anyone have such crude and coarse ideas of God? We refuse to say that God is such an extended, long, broad, thick, high, low being. We confess that God is a supernatural, unfathomable being, who at one and the same time is entirely in every little kernel of grain, and also in and above and outside all creatures. God cannot be fenced in as the false spirits dream. Let him observe this paradox. A human body is much, much too large for the Godhead. In fact, many thousand Godheads could find ample room in one human body. On the other hand, one body is far too small for only one Godhead. Nothing is so small, God is still smaller. Nothing so large, God is still larger. Nothing so wide. God is still wider, nothing so narrow. God is still narrower. In short, God's being is so far above and beyond words and thought that it is simply indescribable. This God in flesh, Jesus, is everything. The fact that there is a God who made the world and who has revealed himself to us by becoming a part of his creation and has done so in order to save you from your sins and troubles to bear all your pain, to pay all your debt, to make you his children, children of God. That is earth-shattering stuff. If that is true, and that is true, nothing else really matters. This isn't just everything. This is the only thing. Christ is life. The rest is just detail. And so every thought, every idea, every philosophy that does not begin and continue and end with Christ is Pointless. So what does this mean? Everything that you hear, every idea, every philosophy for life is to be taken captive to this. Compared to Christ's word, to his gospel. If it isn't Christ, it isn't right. Throw it out and send your roots down into him and into his word, into that central fact of his incarnation and death and resurrection for you. He is everything. He who fills all things, who is the fullness of God. And now look what Paul says next. He who is the fullness of God, he is your fullness. You are filled in him. Filled in him because your sins are forgiven. And you're completely righteous. Paul explains this in terms of circumcision. In the Old Testament, you know, male Israelites, when they were eight days old, had a piece of skin from the male reproductive organ, organ cut off. And this was done to remind them of God's promise to Abraham to send a savior. It was going to be through Abraham's reproductive organ that this was going to happen, right? That through the children of Israel, one generation after another, God was going to perpetuate that line, and through them, he was going to bring his son. And the second reason that God did this particular sign was to remind them of what Christ was going to do. That this cutting away of the flesh, of the body, was a picture of how Christ, in his body, would cut away our sinful flesh. See, over time... People started to get the idea that circumcision was one of these sorts of things that you do in order to earn God's favor. You know, like 
not drinking green tea or something like that. And so there were these people telling the Colossians, who were Gentiles, you guys need to be circumcised if you're going to be Christians. And Paul says, no. No. Because first of all, it was never meant to earn God's favor. And secondly, it has been fulfilled. It was a picture of Christ, and he is here. It was the shadow, and he is the substance. He is the fullness and the completeness. In him, Paul is saying, you've already been circumcised. Because notice how he says this. In in verse 12, he says, Having been buried with him through baptism, in which you were also raised with him. In baptism, you were joined with Christ. You were joined with his death and his resurrection so that they became yours. So that in God's book, you already died for your sins because Christ did on the cross. And you've already been raised to new life, a life of faith, which never ends. Now, Paul also says, that on the cross, Christ was circumcised. He's not talking about when he was an eight-day-old baby and he was circumcised according to the covenant of Abraham. He says in verse 11, according to the circumcision of Christ, the removal of the body of flesh, that phrase, the body of the flesh, was used by Paul last chapter. It's a unique phrase. And he used it to refer to Jesus' own body in contrast to those people who were claiming that God couldn't take a body. And how on the cross, that body was cut away in death. That his blood, the blood of God, was shed for you and he died. And he had taken upon himself all of your sinful flesh so that when he was cut off, it was cut off. And you were raised with him in faith so that when you were raised with him, you were raised as holy and righteous, as complete in him without sins, holy. You who were dead in your trespasses, in all those missteps, you were forgiven. You are made alive in Christ. And get this, every time that message of forgiveness is proclaimed to you by by me or a fellow Christian, every time it is proclaimed and you believe it, believe that gospel, it is a resurrection every time. And by that, I don't mean that it's like you go along and, you know, you kind of sin today and you have this trespass and you sin and then, oh, I really got to get to church and make sure that I hear my sins are forgiven because until I do that, I'm going to have all these sins on my, on my conscience. You, when you receive the forgiveness of sins, you're not receiving anything you didn't have before. Every time, you're receiving it in total. Not like, oh, you're forgiven for the sins of this week. No, you are complete, it says, in him. What does that leave out? Nothing. He is the fullness of God and you are filled in him with all of his fullness, with all the righteousness and holiness of God. Every time that he comes to you in word and sacrament, that is what you get. All of him. His fullness. All of your sins, past, present, and future, removed completely at his cross. Raised with him in life. A life that doesn't end. Now, Paul further describes how this happens for our great comfort. He says that you all had a record, a rap sheet, a mile long. He uses this term, refers to a record of debts that was against you because of the law that we did not keep. And he talks about there being handwriting. It it, it isn't translated that way, but one of the words literally means handwriting on a wall. And that is meant to recall to our minds the story of Daniel. Daniel had been an advisor to King Nebuchadnezzar in Babylon. But many years had gone by, and Nebuchadnezzar's grandson, Belshazzar, was a fool. He didn't remember Daniel. He was feasting one night with his heedless heathen friends, and they brought out the instruments from the temple of the Lord from Jerusalem and made merry with them, making fun of God. All of a sudden, a hand appeared, just a hand, writing words on the wall. And they didn't know what it said. (coughs) Pretty creepy, huh? Well, Belshazzar's grandmother remembered Daniel, and she told Belshazzar, you you should call in Daniel. So Daniel comes in, and he's probably pretty old by this time, and he tells him what the words say. You have been weighed. You have been measured. You have been found wanting. And tonight, your kingdom will be taken away from you. 
At that moment, the Persian army was digging a trench to divert the river that ran through the city in order to open up a moat that they could walk through under the wall and destroyed that kingdom. That handwriting is on the wall for you too. God's law says to you, you have been weighed, you have been measured, you've been found wanting. But Christ comes and erases it. That's what Paul says. He's blotted it out. He has removed that record of debts, taking it out of the way by nailing it to the cross. It died when he died, and it stayed buried when he came out of the tomb. It is gone, removed entirely. All the demands of the law are gone because he fulfilled them for you and died for all your failures. He has removed the curse of the law because he was cursed for you. He has removed sin because he has died for every sin. And so you are complete in him. You are everything and have everything in Jesus. His fullness. His victory. Look at how wonderfully boastful verse 15 is. The rulers and authorities it speaks of here would be the devil and his evil angels and all those who are allied with them. These, it says, Christ has put to open shame. It means he has publicly embarrassed them because he who died rose again. They conspired against him, thought that by death they would win, that they would defeat him. But because of his resurrection, his death proved their ultimate demise and destruction. In sports terms, he gave them a whooping, a whopping, and a good old-fashioned spanking. He beat them into the dust and then boasted right in their faces. That victory, that boast, is yours over sin and death and hell. This victory is complete. It is full. It is your fullness because he is the fullness of God. That's a philosophy to live by to proclaim. It's the only one, the philosophy of Christ, that he is everything and the only thing. That he is life and the rest is just detail. That all the fullness of God dwells in him and that you, by faith, live in him and find your fullness there. Think about this. When you come to receive the Lord's Supper, that in these ordinary elements bread and wine, you are receiving Christ, in whom dwells bodily the fullness of the Godhead. You're not receiving a part of him. You're not receiving him in a way that your senses can understand, but only faith. Jesus did not say, here, I give you a piece of my body and a sip of my blood. He said, this is my body. This is my blood. Holy, completely and it is your completion. Every way in which he comes to you in word and sacrament, he gives himself entirely to you, he who is the fullness of God. And think about this now when you leave and with how you live. You are filled with all the fullness of God. He dwells in you. And he dwells in your brother and your sister. Think about that and how you treat them. Think about that and how you witness to others and how you speak of Christ and to others. Because Christ is your philosophy for life. He isn't just everything. He's the only thing. He is life. The rest is just detail. Amen. And now the peace of God which passes